A list of proposals by the Biden administration appear to give the World Health Organization the right to tell the U.S. what to do in a pandemic. The proposals could be incorporated into a global pandemic treaty. Some members of Congress are calling on the White House to pull out of the WHO altogether. Others think the concerns are overblown. Dale Hurd explains. The World Health Organization's 75th World Health Assembly is underway in Geneva, Switzerland. And one of the items on the agenda are amendments to the WHO's international health regulations. There's been widespread concern that amendments offered by the Biden administration would hand over U.S. national sovereignty on matters of health to the WHO. They would allow the WHO to declare a health emergency in the United States, require the U.S. to report to an international compliance committee on whether it was obeying WHO directives and would create an enforcement mechanism to essentially punish nations that don't follow the WHO's directives. And that would mean whether it's social distancing, whether businesses are essential or not, whether churches are essential, lockdowns, different kinds of treatment, all of that would be under the jurisdiction and sovereignty of an international body and no longer under the United States of America. Representative Chris Smith, ranking member of the House Global Health Subcommittee, called it an egregious breach of constitutional principle. Adding to suspicion about the amendments is that they were sent to the WHO in January, apparently without a public announcement, and were only discovered online last month. The wording of the amendments would certainly seem to give the WHO authority over the U.S. government. But how much teeth would the amendments actually have? The WHO Director General has branded claims that the amendments are a power grab, distortions and disinformation, saying the WHO could not override the sovereignty of member nations. WHO is an expression of member states' own sovereignty and WHO is entirely what the sovereign 194 member states want WHO to be. And a Georgetown University law professor who helped write the international health regulations that the Bush White House signed on to in 2005 said the WHO only has the power to make recommendations. It could not force a country to allow WHO staff to interfere with its public health decision making. Travis Weber, vice president for policy and government affairs at the Family Research Council, says while the amendments offered are disturbing, even if the international health regulations had the force of a treaty, which they do not, the U.S. Constitution would have the final say and not the WHO. It does not trump the Constitution. Even in the case of a treaty, it's similar to a statute passed by Congress in its level of authority. The Constitution still trumps that. And a new report says the amendments are now not expected to even be decided on this week. There is, however, concern the amendments could be incorporated into a new global pandemic treaty, which the WHO has been calling for. Republican Senators Steve Daines and Tom Cotton sent a letter to the White House Friday calling for the U.S. to leave the WHO as it did under President Trump, saying the World Health Organization absolutely cannot be trusted with more power. It's clear from several of the WHO's own statements that it wants more power to fight future pandemics. What's not clear is if the proposed amendments would grant it the power some say it will. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, I'm not exactly trusting of the WHO to fight future pandemics just because of their performance during COVID. Uh, they actually congratulated China, and they seem to bend over backwards to not offend China in all of their discoveries, even though China at that point was actively concealing uh, their research. We're not re releasing it to the world, the world medical community. And when, when you start understanding that was a political move and not a medical move, uh, then it makes you question, uh, should we allow power to something that is quite obviously political? Uh, they're not seemingly following medical advice. They're being very political in their decisions. Uh, I don't want any part of that, and I don't want U.S. sovereignty ever under anything like that. Well, in other news, an independent investigation finds that leaders of the Southern Baptist Commission 
failed to properly look into allegations of sex abuse over a 20-year period. Efren Graham has that story from our CBN newsroom. Efren? Gordon, an SBC task force authorized the report from Guidepost Solution and it's at its annual meeting last year. Guidepost investigated how the SBC Executive Committee handled allegations of sexual abuse from January 2000 to June 2021. It found committee members ignored reports of abuse, discouraged investigations, and did not share the allegations with trustees. It also said there is no indication those accused of abuse were removed from their positions. Furthermore, the report says those who brought allegations and criticized the lack of action were accused of wanting to harm the convention and to profit from lawsuits. SBC President Ed Litton said Sunday he is grieved to my core for the victims. And I pray Southern Baptists will begin preparing today to take deliberate action to address these failures. The committee will hold a special meeting Tuesday to begin discussion on implementing reforms. The Justice Department is announcing new guidelines, grants, and steps to raise awareness about hate crimes across the country after the attack that killed 10 African Americans at a Buffalo supermarket. The DOJ is investigating the Buffalo massacre as a hate crime and an act of racially motivated violent extremism. Unfortunately, we are gathered today in the shadow and the wake of another horrific attack. If it's possible to even further redouble our efforts, something like this can only cause us to do so. Attorney General Merrick Garland recently unveiling $10 million in new federal grant money to help fight hate crimes. The men and women in blue are not immune from the surge in violent crime across America. More and more police are becoming crime victims. The FBI and law enforcement are trying to shine a light on the problem and come up with solutions. CBN's Brody Carter has more. We have, to, we have to look at how police officers now are being attacked. They're being attacked simply because uh, of the uniforms they, they wear. 73 police officers were killed on the job in 2021. That's nearly a 60% jump in police officer deaths than the previous year. Retired Dallas Police Sergeant Trey Penny is president of the National Fallen Officer Foundation and says violence aimed at police is unlike anything he's seen before. 86 uh, ambush-style attacks last year, 26 officers killed. Uh, this year alone, we've already had 26 uh, ambush attacks and, and, and seven officers killed. So why the increase? FBI Director Christopher Ray says some of it's tied to an increase in violent crimes as a whole. In 2020, murder jumped 29% in the U.S., with nearly 5,000 more people killed than 2019. Possible reasons include more juveniles committing violent crimes, increased gun trafficking, and an alarming number of some of the worst criminals getting back on the streets. Last year, officers were being killed at a rate of almost one every five days. The FBI arrested some 15,000 violent gang members last year. Christopher Ray says they're working with task forces and local law enforcement agencies nationwide to try and mitigate this surge in violence. Still, gun violence remains at an all-time high. Researchers for the New England Journal of Medicine found gun violence increased during COVID. There's no clear correlation. Still, some 45,000 firearm-related deaths took place in 2020. Sergeant Penny believes social media is a big part of the problem. I've been a proponent for... Um regulated social media because of the online radicalism. You know, date back to uh, the 2016 shooting attack in Dallas, Texas, where, um, you know, five officers were killed. And like I said, two, two of the officers were really good friends of mine. It would not have occurred that way had, not, had it not been for the social media online radicalization. Now these platforms are being used to incite violence across the country uh, against police officers. And, and, you know, you have a lot of people, especially on the political spectrum, that have used uh, this free speech narrative, um, you know, saying that people need to be able to express their opinion. In the worst cases, Sergeant Penny says those opinions lead to tragedy. Most recently in a Buffalo grocery store where the shooter targeted black people, killing 10 and injuring three based on a racist ideology investigators believe the shooter found online. Sergeant Penny filed a lawsuit against Facebook, Twitter and Google in connection with the 2016 Dallas shooting. The courts let them go. But it's not stopping law enforcement from finding solutions to serve and protect the men and women who've sworn to do the same. We will follow the facts wherever they lead 
to whomever they lead, no matter who likes it. Brody Carter, CBN News. A reprieve for law enforcement on the southern border. Officials were expecting an increase in attempted illegal crossings if the planned lifting of a COVID immigration policy went forward. The policy allows the rapid expulsion of migrants for public health reasons. The Biden administration wanted to end Title 42 today, but a federal judge blocked the plan Friday. The judge agreed with 24 state attorneys general who argued the administration did not follow proper procedure in canceling the policy. Turning now to Asia, where President Biden made a surprisingly strong statement regarding America's commitment to help Taiwan if China invades. At a news conference in Tokyo, a reporter asked the president if U.S. assistance to Taiwan would include a military response. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's the commitment we made. A White House official said the president did not announce a change in U.S. policy and that he was only repeating a decades-long commitment to provide Taiwan with military aid to defend itself against an invasion by China. China expressed strong dissatisfaction and firm opposition to the president's statement. Gord. Well, this is a sea change in American foreign policy. You go back to 1979 um, and... The U.S. changed its position towards Taiwan. There used to be a mutual defense agreement, but in 1979, all of that changed, and there was no commitment on the part of the U.S. to come to Taiwan's defense in the event of an invasion or an attack by China. Uh, that was applauded at the time by China, and it was the result of all the detente and, you know, let's, let's be friends with China, and let's see if China will open up. Um, what, what's unusual is the president of the United States has come out with this statement and has done it instead of formally through the normal diplomatic channels to do it in a press conference. The reason why he did it, and this is sort of all coming to light as a result of the comment, is he's standing next to the prime minister of Japan. And instead of an agreement with Taiwan, what has come out is there is an agreement with Japan to defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack. And that agreement allows U.S. Marines to occupy uninhabited islands in Japan in order to provide a defense, a mutual defense, uh, against a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, these things shouldn't come out this way in news conferences. And I said during the Trump administration, we shouldn't be governed by 3 a.m. tweets. Uh, I'll say to the Biden administration, please don't let us be governed or let our foreign policy be announced in the middle of press conferences. This isn't the proper way to do it. It's happening where you might least expect it. A vibrant Christian community is experiencing salvations, healings, and baptisms in the Holy Spirit. It's not at a church or a spiritual retreat. This is all happening at Harvard University Law School. Mark Martin explains. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On a Tuesday night at Harvard Law School, you might expect to see study groups involving case law or researching legal precedents. These students, however, are studying the Bible. First-year law student Matt Chun says he was pleasantly surprised to learn how vibrant the Christian community is here. It's been incredibly encouraging for me uh, being involved with Christian Union and small groups uh, and even going to church with my classmates um, and going to prayer in the mornings. Uh, it seems like there's Christian programming almost every day and tons of ways to get plugged in and involved. As a ministry director for the organization Christian Union, Justin Yim leads the Bible study. We know that God is not dead at Harvard, and uh, we see God moving uh, powerfully. And we sense, if you speak to some of the other campus ministers on campus and some of the students, there's something happening underneath. Third-year law student Chrissy Anunziata says she expected it to be tough as a Christian here, yet found her faith flourishing after seeing Jesus move in so many ways. I've seen people come to Christ. I've seen, um, you know, people 
receiving the Holy Spirit and I've seen healings. I mean, and it's just incredible to me, like the community that is here, because it's not just the law students when we host events. I mean, we have people coming across the different masters and doctoral programs across the campus. And a lot of them in the science fields, engineering, computer science, things like that. Third year law student Mariana Marquez and her husband Jacob Hawkins, a Harvard Kennedy School of Government grad, started a weekly Miracles, Signs and Wonders workshop shop. They say participants have witnessed the miraculous. At the end, he, he was like, oh, well, I don't know if I can ask this, but um, I have one leg that is shorter than the other and I have back pain and all of that. And uh, so he asked for prayer and um, we had a student in, in the workshop just pray and command that leg to come even out in the name of Jesus. And we all literally saw it as he was commanding the leg to grow out in the name of Jesus. It was growing out and it just evened out. We've seen Jesus cast out demons out of people. And you know, we've been, we've been participating, right? We've, we've been saying in the name of Jesus, get out. Um, we've seen demons leave. We've seen people being freed from anxiety. We've seen someone with a, a really bad jaw, uh, like a locked jaw. Um, Jesus like healed, healed her jaw. We're gathering together across ministries, uh, across the graduate schools, coming together, worshiping together, praying together, and we're all pressing in for the same thing. We want, we want to see Christ lifted high and exalted, and we want to see revival on, on the campus. Yim says the Christian presence is not out of character here. When you think about the history of Harvard University in and of itself, that it started out as a place where, um, you know, men were train for the Christian ministry, right? So it is hearkening back to its original roots. So we know that God has worked here before and we know that God is working. Christians at Harvard Law School can also find support through the program on biblical law and Christian legal studies. The office is located in the building behind me. And according to its website, the program integrates law, leadership and life built on a foundation of biblical wisdom and truth. It's that combination of, of teaching and scholarship and also building up um, and discipleship of, of believers who are here. Um, it's just been very encouraging. We can't clearly get a full picture understanding of the law without understanding the biblical principles behind it. The intersection of Christianity and the law is just so important. Um, it's a field that needs to be explored and I think um, I think it's amazing to have that resource here on campus. And for Christians considering a legal education here, Anunziata offers words of encouragement. If that is what you feel like God wants you to do, um, you should just know that there are people here who will support you. There are professors here who will pray with you. There are students here who will be with you through all the struggles. Mark Martin, CBN News, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Just when you think it's the worst, God shows up and he shows through and he starts shining a light of revival. Um, congratulations to Christian Union. Uh, they've been at it for years. They're located in New York City, but they're a group that is dedicated to bringing Christ back to the Ivy League. Uh, when you get to the foundations of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, you find that they're all founded to train ministers to preach the gospel. They were all founded to teach Hebrew and Greek so you could read the scriptures in the original languages. Um, and you, you look at that history and, and God loves history and he loves the covenants that our forefathers made so long ago and he wants to reinvigorate them. So congratulations to Christian Union. Vibrant cha chapters, not just at Harvard Law, but also at Yale, also at Princeton, uh, also at Columbia. They're doing some very wonderful work, and I encourage you to check it out and see how you can be a part. Ashley? Well, according to Andy Stanley, 2020 brought out the best in us and also the worst. It showcased strengths. It revealed weaknesses, unfortunately, and Andy says, embarrassingly, it also revealed what we care about most. Author and pastor Andy Stanley says the church's response to the political, economic, and health crises of 2020 revealed a lot about evangelicals and what they value the most. We've chosen to follow in the path of the current 
cultural and political divide rather than coming together to serve as the conscience of our nation. Once again, we have followed rather than influenced. In his book, Not In It To Win It, he calls the church to reevaluate our politics through a filter of faith rather than creating versions of faith to support our politics. All right, well, Andy Stanley, Stanley joins us now via Skype. Andy, thank you so much for being with us this morning. All right, well, uh, I think we might be having some technical difficulties, but let's, let's see if the audio is still there. Um, Andy, let's get right into it. How did evangelicals surrender influence outside the church in 2020? Well, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic again with all the uh, election cycle um, craziness, unfortunately, uh, the evangelical community, for the most part, I think, um, evacuated the middle. Um, problems are solved in the middle. It's a messy middle for sure, but things were so polarized. Everybody, you know, f went far left or far right because nobody wanted to be left behind. And of course, Christians never want to be left behind. A little play on words there. So in the book, Not In It To Win It, I'm, I'm asking the evangelical community and Christians in particular to regain the moral high ground. And let's once again serve as the conscience of our nation. But the only way for us to do that is to be unified around the message and the teaching of Jesus as facilitated and illustrated by the Apostle Paul. So I think we still have an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity. And I felt like we missed it. I think we can get it right. And so I wrote this book to encourage evangelicals to perhaps get it right this next time. Yeah, well, the book is called Not In It To Win It. Why shouldn't the church be in it to win it? Um, you know, I think it can slightly be confusing because we're told to win souls for Jesus. But what right, uh, right. competition are you necessarily talking about? Well, this, the subtitle of the book is Why Choosing Sides sidelines the church. And when the church is divided um, over politics, it loses its unity and its opportunity to make a difference in the world. And um, allowing any outside force to divide the church is a tragedy because the number one enemy of the church is disunity. And I say that because when Jesus prayed for the future church in John 17, he prayed that we would be one in purpose, just like he and the Father were one in purpose. And he said, and this is mission critical because the unity of the church is the message to the world. Jesus said that my Father actually sent me. So it's mission critical for us to be unified around the things that unify us. And there's so much to be unified around. But anytime a church, a local church or a group of churches or the church in general allows itself to be divided, especially by politics, we lose our opportunity um, to have a unified message to the world. And uh, once again, to be the conscience of the nation. So yes, we are, you said it exactly right. We are in it to win souls, but we are not in it to win elections. And we are not in it to save America. We are in it to save Americans. But the best thing that could happen to the United States of America is for a unified church to once again, exemplify the message, the grace, the mercy, and the morality and the ethics as illustrated in and taught by our Lord Jesus. So we have an extraordinary opportunity and the darker it gets, the brighter our light has the opportunity to shine if we get this right and if we don't confuse what we're in it to win for. Yeah. Well, Andy, what role should the church have in politics? I mean, if one if one politician or party is is taking a stance that's not necessarily biblical, uh, shouldn't the church speak up? What what is your what is your yes. stance on that? Absolutely. No, then I'm glad you asked this question. Yes, we should be so committed to the gospel and to following Jesus that as a Republican and uh, or as a Democrat, we have we, we feel empowered to call out our own party as opposed to remaining silent because we don't want to be ostracized by friends and family members and members of our own party. So the point of the book is this, whenever our politics is elevated above our faith, and no Christian thinks they do that, but it happens all the time. When our politics is elevated above our faith, we will, sh we will shy away from calling out the people in our party when they get it wrong. And if faith is not elevated above politics, we will eventually compromise our faith in order to protect our political point of view. So absolutely, Christians should stand up when it comes to issues, but we should not so align with either political party that we lose our unified voice. So this is not a call to withdraw from the process. I tell people in our church all the time, you should run for office, you should be more involved, and you should never miss an opportunity to vote your Christ-informed 
conscience when it comes to the opportunity to vote because it's one of the greatest opportunities we have and it's the you know it's the stewardship of our nation is at stake when it comes to voting so we should be involved we should speak out but we should never allow our political views to be elevated above our faith. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you also say that Christians can, in fact, maintain unity while disagreeing politically. But you said in your book yep. that it's hard. And one of the reasons yep. why is because of something called fundamental attribution error. Explain that. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamental attribution error is when I ascribe motives to other people, but I give myself a pass because of circumstances. So the way it works out in politics is this is what we hear. The Democrats, the Democrats, the Democrats, the Republicans, the Republicans, the Republicans, we lump people together, associate things with them that have to do with their character as opposed to their life experience. And one of the most important things Christians should understand in particular is that most people's politics are determined by their life experiences. And the reason we see the world so different than some people is because of life experience. So anytime we catch ourselves saying or thinking, I don't understand how those people could, I don't know how anybody could vote for them. That. I don't know how anybody could be for him or be for her. We need to stop as Christians and ask the question, okay, obviously there's something I don't know. And if I want to influence people, and if I want to influence what's happening in our nation, I need to be a student first and a critic second. But the moment we come in with both guns, bla guns blazing as critics, we don't learn anything. And honestly, we don't make any difference. So for the folks in your audience, and the folks in your audience love this country like I do, want to make a difference in this country like I do, our best bet is to take our cue from the posture and the tone of the Lord Jesus Christ and the impossible. Apostle Paul, who were up against insurmountable odds, and yet their teaching and their writing, the writing of the Apostle Paul, shaped Western civilization and eventually toppled the Roman Empire. So there is a way forward. Jesus models the way forward. The Apostle Paul tells us how to apply that way forward. And so I wrote, not in it to win it, because I want our nation to win, and I want the church to win, and those two things are not mutually exclusive. Amen. All right, Andy, last question. How can Christians evaluate politics through a filter of faith? It's very simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> Jesus gave us one overarching command. He said, by this, all men will know that you're my follower. If you love one another, not the way you've seen love played out in the past, if you will love one another the way that I have loved you, that's going to unify you as a group of people, he said to his first century followers. And that is the message that changed the world. So what I say to our congregation all the time is whenever there's a tension, relationally or politically, we should ask the question, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? That's the message that Jesus left. And it's not passive. It's not weak. Remember, the next day after he gave that command, he gave his life for your sin and my sin and for the world. So this isn't passive. This isn't sit back and just watch things unfold. And this isn't some kind of mushy, uh, make it up in the moment kind of love. This is love that's direct, it's honest, but it's compassionate, and it reflects the tone and the posture of the Lord Jesus. And to the degree that the church gets this right, to that degree, we will in fact influence the United States of America. I love that. Well, for more with Andy Stanley, be sure to check out his new book. It's called Not In It to Win It, and it's available nationwide. Andy, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you so much for your book and your timely message. Thank you so much, Ashley. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Hillary Clinton personally agreed to release information to a reporter in 2016 during the presidential campaign about a supposed connection between Donald Trump's campaign and a Russian bank. Even though the Clinton team was not completely confident the story was true, that was the testimony from Robbie Mook, Clinton's former campaign manager in 2016. He made that statement during the criminal trial of the Clinton campaign attorney, Michael Sussman, which is part of the special counsel, John Durham's inquiry into what actually happened during the, quote, Russiagate investigation of the Trump campaign that year. For Easter, CBN India produced a special Ask Gizmo episode in Hindi, India's most spoken language for Facebook. The series aims to answer questions children have about everyday life situations and what the Bible says about them. In this special Easter episode, the host and Gizmo answer questions about Easter, God, friends, and more. The episode was a hit with young fans and has now reached more than 94,000 views. 
You can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Raquel was told it was all her fault. She must not have taken care of herself while she was pregnant. The young mother was devastated to think that she caused her daughter to be born with a cleft lip. And to make matters worse, Raquel had no money for the surgery to fix it. The morning Raquel went into labor with her fourth child, her husband, Benildo, ran frantically to get the midwife. By the time he returned, Rachel had given birth to a baby girl. That's when he saw the cleft lip. I was very sad to see my daughter like this. None of my children had been born with this condition. I had never seen a person born like this. As Elizabeth grew, Benildo and Raquel decided to introduce her to the relatives. My mother welcomed us with joy, but my sister said she didn't like my baby because she wasn't pretty like her other nieces. Raquel went home crying that day. She blamed herself for Elizabeth's condition. People said it happened because I didn't take care of myself during pregnancy, especially during the full moon. They all say it was my fault. For that reason, I decided not to go outside with her. I even had to stop attending church. The family had already been struggling to provide for their three other children. Benildo earns about $6 a day when he can find work in construction. I barely had enough to feed my family, much less pay for surgery. I went out and hid behind the house and I started crying. Sometimes I thought that God was punishing us by making it so hard for our daughter. And we didn't want our baby to suffer as she got older. When Operation Blessing met with the family, we gave them some good news. They say they wanted to help my daughter. I was very happy because God heard our prayers. I thank God because he did not abandon us. Now my daughter will have a normal mouth. Operation Blessing provided free surgery to repair Elizabeth's cleft lip. I thank God for my daughter's surgery. A few weeks after the operation, Elizabeth was able to begin eating solid food, and her mouth looks great. I thank the people who help Operation Blessing, and I ask God to bless them so they can continue helping more people. Yeah, that thank you and those blessings go to our CBN partners. If it wasn't for you guys coming alongside of us in the name of Jesus and helping people in very tangible ways like you just saw, uh, what you just saw wouldn't even happen. So we just want to say thank you. And if you aren't a CBN partner, but you just watched that story and you feel compelled to, to help people in need and spread the message of the gospel all while doing so, Join with CBN. It's super simple. All you have to do is give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com, or you can do my personal favorite, which is text to give. All you have to do is text CBN to 71777, and from there, a giving page will pop up, and there you can choose what level you would like to join at. You can join at the 700 Club level, which is $20 a month. Some of you might already be there, and you might consider going up from there, which would be $40 a month. Some of you can do even more, which would be $84 a month. Just do whatever the Lord is asking you to do. And as ch children of God, you know, God is very generous and he calls us to be generous because we're made in his image. So if you want to give out of the the, out of the overflow of your heart and the overflow of what God is doing in your life, give us a call or text us. Text CBN to 71777. For 10 years, Brian was trapped in his own body. The retired police officer had broken his neck in two places and was paralyzed on his right side. Every day was a battle. As the years wore on, Brian came to accept that he would never recover. Not so for his wife. She never stopped believing for a miracle. On December 19, 2008, a winter storm had blanketed Little Falls, New Jersey in snow. 39-year-old police officer Brian LaPou was redirecting motorists away from an icy road when he slipped. The only thing I remember is waking up in a hospital as they were trying to incubate me. After further examination, doctors discovered Brian had broken two vertebrae in his neck and had to perform emergency surgery. When Brian woke up, the right side of his body was paralyzed. I was panicking. 
uh, scared. Adding to his fears, the divorced father of three had remarried, and his wife, Meg, was expecting. He's paralyzed. My husband's paralyzed. I was newly married. I had just lost my father. I just, I was like, this can't be real. Still, doctors were confident that in time, he would fully recover. After his release four weeks later, Brian went on disability and would spend countless hours in physical therapy relying on a walker and leg brace to get around. As the weeks and months ticked by, there was no improvement and he was in constant pain. And now he and Meg had a newborn in the home. I spent a lot of time asking God for, for him to help me and get through all of this. I would always say, Lord, why, why is this happening to me? You know, I'm supposed to be a child of yours, and I feel like I'm getting beat up worse than somebody else. Then, after more than a year of fighting, Brian began losing function on the left side of his body, and doctors operated on his neck again. Afterwards, not only was Brian still paralyzed, he had debilitating migraines. Now doctors were saying Brian would never recover, forcing him into early retirement. If this is what I'm going to be for the rest of my life, I can't, I can't do it. I can't be like this. I can't be in this much pain and not have any relief. I cried out and I said, Lord, you need to do something because I can't take it anymore. In all that time and the years to come, Meg refused to give up hope. She turned to friends, family, and their church for prayer and even took Brian to some healing conferences. Brian, on the other hand. She always believed I was going to get healed, and I didn't always believe that, uh, I'll be honest. For 10 years, Brian tried to come to terms with his paralysis. One saving grace was that he's left-handed and could at least try to enjoy some of the things he loved, like hunting, fishing, and being with his wife and kids. Even then, he was limited. Then, in August 2019, Meg convinced Brian to go to yet another healing conference. Right before we left, you know, he would pack his brace, his charger, his crutches, and I told him, you don't even need your crutches. Don't bring your crutches, because you're not going to need it. Brian had been down this road before. The last thing I wanted to do is hear another person talk about healing. and I didn't want to get prayed for again, because I've been prayed for hundreds of times before. At the conference, many people were being called forward for prayer. Brian wasn't one of them. Furious, Meg stormed out of the room. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Yeah, I was mad at God. While she was out... It felt like somebody grabbed me by the back of my neck and picked me straight up and made me start walking forward. Moments later... I came back, and he was on the floor. They were praying for him. I see his hand go up, moving. He's smiling, he's, and I'm, I'm in amazement and shock, you know. It's happening, right? It's happening. I looked at my hand and I, and I said, well, move. And like I've tried a million times before, it was crunched up and curled over. It started to straighten. And then my fingers would wiggle. And I was like, oh my God. And it's all twitchy and it's all, spasming and it's all crazy but it's moving and it never did that before then he takes his brace off and he starts walking around he walked around this is probably at 11 o'clock at night walks around the sanctuary a couple times then they let go and there's three people holding him and then they let go and he walks around by himself wow. come on jesus six months later and a report from brian's pain management doctor Brian still shows no signs of disability. Now working full-time at a rock quarry, he's grateful to have his life back and especially enjoys every minute he has with his family. I mean, you stop and you're like, what just happened? What happened? Like, he broke his neck. He was paralyzed. This fight, and then he gets healed. Like, what? Like, again, this is another thing. This just doesn't happen to people like us. I tell everybody, when was the last time you saw a paralyzed guy walk? I never did until it was me. It's still mind boggling. I can't explain it other than I'm living it. And, and it happened to me firsthand.
This doesn't happen to people like us. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. All you have to do is believe and keep on believing. When all the symptoms are screaming at you, no, you're not healed, keep on believing. Keep on seeking it. Keep on asking for it. Keep on knocking until that door opens up. That's why Jesus gave us the example of the importune widow who went to an unrighteous judge. She knew that if she could get him up and out of bed, she would get the answer to her request. Well, we serve a very righteous God who never sleeps, who never slumbers. He's always there. And here's the best news. He wants to heal. If we could figure it out, it wouldn't be a miracle. But because we can't figure it out, we give him all the glory because he's worked something doctors say is impossible. A doctor would say, someone who's paralyzed, I mean, if you don't see improvement within the first six months, uh, you're not going to see it. If there's nothing after a year, you're never going to see it. And here, after 10 years, a man looks at his hand and commands it, move. And his hand moved. Isn't that wonderful? I love the honesty. We were tired of being prayed for. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to hear another healing message. Um, you know, God had forgot. Healings aren't for people like us. I, I love the honesty of that. And who else loves the honesty of that? God does. He sees your tears. He hears your heart cry. He wants to break through for you. What is he waiting for? For you to completely surrender. God, I'm all in. I'm with you. I, I don't understand what's happening to me, but I trust in your unfailing love. I lean into you. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm going to keep knocking until I get the answer. Now, we're going to pray for you. I encourage you to get ready to get prayed for. Anything that's on your heart, anything where you're mad at God or you're mad at yourself or you're mad at somebody else, leave all that behind. If there are things you're doing in your life that aren't pleasing to you and you know they're not pleasing to God, well, then get rid of that. Turn away from that. Ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you. And we're going to pray. We're going to come. If our conscience is clear, we get to come before him. And the amazing thing is he wants to clean your conscience for you. He wants to do that for you. That's why Jesus died for sinners. He did it for you. You can be one of the believers. All you have to do is leave all this other stuff behind. Now, here's some other miracles, and this is a dramatic one, as dramatic as the one you just saw. This is Sandy. For the last several years, I've been getting a shot in my left eye due to a wet macula, which if not treated, leads to blindness. On April 27th, that's this year, Ashley was praying Healed of autoimmune diseases that have affected your eyesight. Wet macula is related to inflammation, which is related to autoimmune. So healed from autoimmune diseases that have affected your eyesight, blurred vision in one eye, the left eye. I just believe that God is healing that for you right now in Jesus' name. Just claim that for yourself. Well, Sandy said, that's me. That's me and accepted the healing for myself when I went to my, for my shot on May 9th. So that's this month. All the pretests were done. The doctor came in and said, are you ready for some good news? The macula in your left eye is totally dry. And not only that, but your reading the eye, uh, on, of the eye chart is also vastly improved. I don't know what you're doing because this just doesn't happen. And only a few ever get to stop the shots in the eye. And he said, I was healed. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I was healed. He can't explain it, but I was healed. Wow. Well, this is another amazing miracle. Gordon had a word of knowledge about a lady with a mass on her right lung last Monday, May 16th. On Tuesday, the next day, I met with the pulmonologist to read a PET scan that had recently, because of a suspected uh, malignancy, the mass had shrunk noticeably and had no characteristics of a cancerous growth. To God be the glory. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Yeah. I'm ready to pray. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready to receive? 
Just ask him, command it, be a, be a believer, be it right now. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing. We come believing in your sacrifice, that what you have done for us, for by your blood, our sins are forgiven. And by your stripes, we are healed. So we receive that. We receive the free gift of salvation. We receive the free gifts of healing. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Ashley, God's given you something. Yeah, I believe God is, is literally healing blindness right now. Yet again, I believe God's doing it again. And if you are watching and you have any vision plot problems, bl blurriness, glaucoma, um, even cancer in your retina, which has caused you not to be able to see, I believe the Lord is healing blind eyes. And I just, in Jesus' name, may there be total restoration in your eyesight in the name of Jesus. Also, someone watching, your left hand is similar to what you saw in that video. It's, it's uh, you can't really move it. It's from uh, paralyzation. There's no strength in that left arm. The Lord is healing this for you right now. You're going to begin to move your fingers, move your arm like you used to. You are healed in Jesus' name. Just receive that right now. Uh, there's someone you've had nerve damage and the right side of your face is, is drooping. It's like you can't control the facial mu muscles in that. I don't know if it's related to Bell's palsy or if it's related to some other problem. God is healing that for you. He's restoring nerve. What doctors say will never happen is happening for you. Smile and realize both sides are smiling. Yeah. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. Here's a word from Matthew. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open.